Hello everyone, welcome, good evening. My name is James Harding, I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. Um, and I'm particularly delighted that tonight we're joined by Lord King, uh, Mervyn, if I may, Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England. Um, uh, we would have had uh, Mervyn here under any circumstances um, because we're all trying to understand the economy we're living in, uh, particularly now. Um, but he's also the author of a new book called Radical Uncertainty, um, which I suppose is not just an idea, but for many of us now is a feeling. Um, I can't remember a time when we've all felt quite as uncertain uh, as we do now. And so in the course of the next hour, we want to do what we typically do at Tortoise, which is not try to add to the breaking news, but try and understand what's driving it. And we do that, if this is your first uh, visit to Tortoise, through what we call a thinking. It's basically like a huge um, editorial meeting, like a great big news meeting where we all sit together and we try and figure out in this particular case what's going to happen to the economy in the UK and, uh, and, and possibly even around the world. Um, and in this case, what we're going to try and do is uh, ransack Mervyn King's brains to try and find out what's the best possible way of understanding unemployment, debt, the recovery uh, that we hope will come. Um, in, that, in that effort, it's really key that we're joined by you. So this is intended to be not just a conversation between me and him, but by all of us. So if you've got something you want to say, please do weave it into the chat. My colleague, uh, fellow editor and partner at uh, Tortoise, Liz Mosley, is trying to marshal uh, the conversation. There she is, the mighty Liz Mosley. And please do just weigh in. I'll try and keep track of what's says, said in the chat and then bring you in personally into the conversation. Alternatively, you'll see there's a little participants tab. If you click on that, that, you can raise your hand and when I see a blue hand come up I'll try and bring you into the conversation um, but with that welcome and a huge welcome to you Mervyn. Um, Mervyn ha having given you the big warm welcome can we just get straight to it how bad is it how bad is the the recession that we're heading into? So I think the word recession is is not the right word to use that we use for cases historical examples where people decide that they don't have the confidence to spend and businesses decide it's too risky to invest. That's something driven by people's behavior. Where we are now is a shutdown of the economy mandated by government. Governments have decided for good reason, health reasons, that the economy should basically stop operating for a period. Now we're trying to come out of it. We have no experience of this. So the only honest answer to your question is we don't know. But I think it will be surprising if we bounce back completely and very quickly to where we were before. I think there will be quite a rapid bounce back as the restrictions are eased. But I don't think it will go back to where we were quickly for two reasons. One is that the overall degree of uncertainty about when we'll get a vaccine, which I think is the moment at which we can get back to, to, to normal, is it's very uncertain. And secondly, that the economy won't look quite the same. So some industries will be expanding, others will be contracting. One only has to think about hospitality and airlines to realize that it will take quite some while, I think, for them to be able to recover back to where they were. So for these two reasons, general uncertainty and the changing nature of the new economy to which we shall return, it's very hard to know, I think, you know, how long it will take or how deep the downturn in the economy will be until we get back to our previous path. And, and what's the range of scepticism, if you like, that economists like you treat the forecasts of other economists? Because, you know, I think we all saw last week that the OECD was anticipating, you know, a 10% decline in the UK economy. You know, that, that's quite a you know, precise number. And that was without a second wave. When, when you see those numbers, <laughs> those forecasts or scenarios, do you think actually that kind of economic thinking is probably pretty robust and it will be around 10% or do you actually not pay much heed to those numbers? I'm in the camp of paying no attention whatsoever to those precise numbers. One of the things that we've learned in this crisis is that it's not just economic models, but also epidemiological models, mm -hmm. which may be very helpful in understanding the nature of the problem we face qualitatively, but are hopeless at predicting the future. 
Mm. And the reason is very obvious in a way, which is that the parameters of those models, which you need to specify in order to make a quantitative prediction of the future, are things about which we know extremely little. Mm. We still don't know very much about the nature of the virus that's hit us. We don't really know about the fatality rate or the number of people who've actually had the disease, whether they can be reinfected. We don't know how long it will take to get to a vaccine. Uh, and just as economic models have the problem of trying to anticipate people's behavior, so when the restrictions start to unease, we do not know how quickly we will get back to normal, which is why it is a little odd that so many people seem to think that central banks have the answer to it, as if a further small reduction in interest rates would make any difference at all to whether people are confident enough to go back to restaurants or theatres or concert halls. So I think the quantitative predictions are for the birds, really, uh, and we shouldn't pay any attention to them. But the, the, the nature of what an epidemic is, that it starts slowly, hard to judge, then it accelerates away from you just as you realise what you're facing, reaches a peak and comes down again. These things are important to understand. They help, help us to shape the response, to realise that there is a risk that the health services could get overwhelmed. Mm. But the actual numbers, I think we should pay very little attention to. And I think one of the mistakes that's been made so far is that government have tended to say, we are doing what the science tells us we must do. But the science doesn't tell us what we must do. It cannot possibly be quantitatively that accurate. And that, that's a big mistake to overestimate the precision of these models. And it's not surprising, therefore, that when so-called experts do try to be excessively precise, that people lose confidence in what they have to offer. And, and, and Mervyn, do you think that on the economics, we are excessively pessimistic or excessively optimistic? Well, it's very hard to judge. And I think, you know, I have great sympathy with governments, politicians having to make these awkward judgments because essentially what they're trying to do is to navigate between two very bad outcomes. One is a further increase in infections and more deaths. And the other would be a continuation of lost incomes, output, jobs and GDP. And, and both of these are pretty horrific. The loss in GDP is going to be very large. Uh, and it's, I think, important that we put into the balance when making those judgments, the not just the lost GDP, but the lost opportunities for young people to go to school and university, and indeed the lost health and well-being, and indeed lives of people suffering from non-COVID-19 diseases. So these are very difficult judgments, but they are judgments, and we elect governments to make those judgments. Mm. We don't elect governments to delegate them to experts who frankly uh, can be very helpful to us in understanding the problem but not in terms of making precise predictions so so do you think i'd like to come back a little bit to that relationship between experts and and governments in a, in a minute but i just wanted to get a sense of direction from you particularly around unemployment and furloughing and the reason i ask this is i remember back to 2007-8 in particular and I think that people found it really hard I certainly did to comprehend the consequences of the financial crisis and if anything most people naturally underestimated it they thought it would be bad in the short term but couldn't imagine how bad it would be for how long when you look at nearly nine million people furloughed and then the risk to jobs that exists do you think that we are appreciating the, the, the scale and the length of the problem that we're facing on the employment front? Well, I think there's a real risk of not taking adequate action to, to deal with it. So I think there's one, one big difference. That there are some similarities between the financial crisis and where we are today, but one very big difference is that there the problem became evident in a small sector of the economy, the banking sector, the problems that we had to deal with were very big problems because if the banking sector had failed, then the ability to pay wages, to pay our bills would have been destroyed. And that is not something you can allow to happen. 
So the monetary system and the banking system are central to the efficient operation of the economy, rather in the way that if the electricity supply failed, then life as we know it would come to an end. So these things are critical to the functioning of the economy, but they weren't immediately apparent to most people. Where we are today is very different. The, the problem is one that everyone is affected by. And we're very well aware, both of the risk of catching this disease, of the consequences of that uh, happening, and of the measures which the government has taken to try to prevent the spread of the disease. I think that if the government announces that we are not allowed to go to work, that we have to stay at home, it has a responsibility to ensure that transfers are made from taxpayers in general to businesses to prevent them failing because their revenue has just disappeared. And I think the responsibility of government is to replace that revenue. Now the furlough scheme is quite a good way of doing it because it's a way of saying to businesses, look, we'll pay the wage bill provided you don't sack people. You must keep them on the payroll, but they can be furloughed because they're not allowed to come to work. The risk at present, I think, is that we may end that scheme too early mm. because some parts of the economy are coming back to life slowly. And for them, the furlough scheme can be unwound. But for other parts of the economy, particularly in the hospitality and entertainment sectors, there is no prospect of their being able to get back to normal and have an adequate revenue stream. I mean, a simple example would be that the South Bank has announced that it doesn't intend to reopen its concert halls and, and so on for quite some considerable time, possibly not until spring next year. Yeah. And the reason is because if they have to practice social distancing, well, you can have an orchestra playing, you can have some audience, but you don't get enough revenue to justify the costs of reopening the concert hall. So I think that some parts of the economy are going to be subject to much delayed reopening compared with others. And for those sectors, I think the government has a responsibility to continue something like a furlough scheme or help for the self-employed until the point when they can return to normal. And at that point, then you can allow the market economy to function again. And the market economy can decide which firms flourish and which firms are allowed to fail. But to decide today which firms are going to fail or flourish because they're suffering from a government mandated shutdown yeah. is completely the wrong thing to do. But Mervyn, there, there, there are two criticisms there, aren't there? One is that the, the October end date is, is different from what you're seeing in other countries such as in Europe, such as France and Germany, where there's a commitment to employee support that runs much longer, six, 18 months. And there's a second criticism, which is you need, I see Sam Houston has made this point in the chat, targeted furlough schemes that are sectoral rather than just across the economy as a whole. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I think there are two parts to it. One is I would want to say that the furlough scheme in general would keep going until GDP as a whole would get back to, say, to within 5% of where it was when the lockdown started. And then beyond that, those sectors that can't get back to normal revenue generating uh, procedures should have a furlough scheme extended until they can. And then after that point, well, then the market will decide which sectors and firms will flourish and which should be allowed to wither on the vine. But we're certainly not in that position now. So, so Mervyn, there are, there are so many sort of questions, points being raised, um, not least uh, the financing of all of this and, and the use of monetary policy. I mean, if I can bring in Jill Ruddock first, I hope, Jill, that you're there because... Uh, yes. Put the question more succinctly than I have. To okay. <laughs> um, yes, it was. It was simply that um, there's a branch of monetary theory which suggests that um, government should print enough money to actually shield the economy from the consequences of the shutdown. Um, and we've seen today, in fact, that 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 um, there has been further quantitative easing, and it was clearly a tool used in the 2008 crisis. Do you, what, what, are the, what do you feel about this and what do you think are the long-term consequences of letting it get out of control? So again, I think there are two parts to, to this issue. The first is, what do I make of modern monetary theory? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what should happen in practice? Now, modern monetary theory is a phrase that people use, but I'm afraid it's neither modern nor monetary nor a theory. 
it is simply a, a description of what we already do and what central banks can do and have done for decades. There's nothing novel in this. I, I think when quantitative easing was introduced, uh, it was very unfortunate that people described it as an unconventional monetary policy instrument. This has been used for decades. What central banks can then do is to buy government bonds. And by doing that, they give, when they buy bonds from typically financial institutions of various kinds who sell them to the central bank, those people get a check drawn on the Bank of England they then deposit in their commercial bank account and bank accounts rise by the full amount of the quantitative easing. In other words, it just expands the money supply. The money supply broadly is really bank accounts, current accounts plus cash produced by the central bank. So it's just a way of expanding the money supply. Now, the question is who should decide on that and what is the right amount to do? That's the substance of it. Mm. The amount to do really is to, to be decided by an independent central bank in such a way that's consistent with ensuring that inflation remains low and stable and the economy can continue to grow. So that the decisions announced by the Bank of England today and in the previous months seem to me perfectly consistent with maintaining low and stable inflation and helping the economy to recover in due course. I don't think today is an obvious reason why expanding the money supply is necessary that will come further down the road. But anyway, it's been done. And uh, I don't think therefore there is any worry from that perspective. Where there would be a concern, I think, is if after this episode is over, those central banks that have ventured into territory which really borders on fiscal policy rather than monetary policy, I'll explain that in a minute, politicians then say, well, you went beyond your mandate. We didn't ask mm. the central bank to do this but you've decided to uh, decide you know, which sectors of the economy get credit. The Federal Reserve, for example, has decided that it will buy debt issued by different layers of government below the federal level. And they introduced a cutoff and small communities complained that the Fed was discriminating between them and bigger communities. That's not the kind of territory central banks should stray into. And if they do, then afterwards, as it happened after the financial crisis, the risk is that Congress or politicians will say, well, look, the things that you did may have been necessary, but they weren't yours to decide. It should have been decided by an elected government or by Congress. So we're going to take the power away from you. And if the independence of central banks with respect to monetary policy disappears, then that's when we should be worried, because that's the situation in which monetary policy could once again become politicized and then inflation could slowly creep up as it did in the 60s, 70s, reaching the peak in the end of 70s and the early 80s. So I think that would be the, the, the worry about uh, allowing so-called mon modern monetary theory to run loose. I think the Bank of England can work with the government to enable the government to issue the debt that it needs to issue to finance its expenditure over a reasonable period of time, rather than having to borrow all in one month. That the central bank can do quite, quite straightforwardly. We did that in the financial crisis. But modern monetary theory does not offer a new way to reduce the burden of the public debt. So, Mervyn, thank you. That is massively interesting. Can, can you just give us a hand in understanding just the issue of debt overall hmm. because it seems to be increasing so much having heard so much for a decade on the need to get debt down suddenly there seems to be an acceptance that we can can borrow and i just i'm really unclear about how much we can borrow and for how long so i think one, one of the reasons for having a national debt is that in times of crisis whether it be a conventional war <clears throat> or dealing with a pandemic then you can allow the national debt to rise quite sharply as a ratio to, to national income. And then in normal times, adopt a fiscal policy that means that slowly it comes down as, as a ratio of our national income. So I think we are in a situation where if to deal with the pandemic, we need to shut down the economy to ensure you know, social distancing on an extreme level, mm. then the 
government has a responsibility and indeed the duty to ensure that our businesses don't just disappear. And we can and to do that. They need to, they need to make transfers from taxpayers in general to those businesses. Mm. Now that is not a, an economic cost. It's just a transfer in money terms from taxpayers in general to businesses. It will boost the national debt quite significantly. Mm. But we will still be well short of the levels that we came out of the Second World War with relative to national income. Now the question is, what does it mean in future? How can we yeah. pay for this? The provided we don't significantly increase our current expenditures, public expenditure on goods and services, we may want to do a bit of that, but provided we don't do it to a significant extent, then we will not need to raise taxes significantly in order to ensure that the ratio of our national debt to national income will start to come back down again once the, uh, this current episode is over. And the reason for that is because if we can grow the economy, I suppose at just 2% a year in real terms, but the government can borrow money at long-term real interest rates, which are below 2%, close to zero at, yeah. at present. And as long as that is true, then the ratio of national debt to national income will gradually fall over time uh, because we start from a position in which we don't have a large budget deficit once we've adjusted for interest payments. So Not all countries are in that position, but we are. And so the basis for the argument that we needed to think carefully about the public finances in the past decade mm. was precisely to get ourselves into a position from which we could then allow the national debt to rise sharply and then allow it to come down once the episode is over. So, so Mervyn, that would suggest that, you know, that, that, that we can afford this borrowing. Some countries can't afford that borrowing, this kind of level of borrowing, or even yeah. if we're hit by the pandemic, and there may be debt crises there to come, but the UK can, for the time being, afford to borrow at this current level. Yes, is the answer to that. So, Mervyn, I'm going to bring in a few people who, I'm going to try and actually just pick up on some of the points that you've made. I'd like to bring in uh, Nico McDonald first, just on the point that you made about the way government does or doesn't lean on experts and where politicians should make judgments and where they don't. I don't know whether, Nico, you're there. there you yeah. Are. Um, Mervyn, uh, very interesting to hear you talking. Um, last year on the Today programme, you observed that issues around identity, culture and politics, not economics, are what is motivating people around Brexit, which is why politicians who talk about the risk of national economic suicide sound out of touch, which I sympathise with. Um, do you see a parallel between that and your observation just now uh, that we don't elect governments to delegate to experts in the sense that they're both reactions against a technocratic approach? So what I think is similar is that economists in the Brexit debate, I mean, there were arguments on both sides, and I think a reasonable person could have been on, on either side. What was wrong, I think, was for economists to pretend that the economics could tell us that every family would be £4,300 worse off a year if we were to leave the European Union. We don't know that, and the assumptions behind the models that we use to generate that are very fragile. The same issue arose on the other side with the uh, money that was going to be saved for the health service. This was banding numbers around in an irresponsible way on both sides, in my view. And I think what's happened in the current crisis is that whereas at the very beginning, I was impressed that the chief medical officer, when asked by a journalist, so how many people are going to die? Said, I don't know, which is exactly the right answer to give. But as we've gone through this, the experts have been sucked into more and more providing numbers which aren't really based on anything other than guesses. I'm not saying they're wrong because I don't know, but they certainly can't know either the parameters that they feed into their models in order to make judgments and quantitative predictions. And so I think it, it, the politicians too were only too willing to say, all we're doing is what the experts tell us we must do, what the science tells us we must do. But it's never that precise because we're dealing not with 
you know, fixed laws of motion of the planets in the universe, which we have understood for centuries, and they don't change over time, and they don't depend on what we believe about them. We're talking here about human behavior, which does change over time, and which does critically depend on what we think will happen in the future. So both in terms of economics and in terms of understanding epidemics, I think we need experts to tell us how to think about the problem, mm. to give us insights into it. We don't need experts to pretend that they know things that they can't possibly know. Mervyn, th thank you for that. I, I, want, I wonder if I could just bring in Vanessa Gray, because there is, a, there is a seam of thinking that you hear in the UK and I think around the world, that the balance on this is we're getting fundamentally wrong, that we are too fearful, that we've, we've created such a fear of the pandemic that we're underestimating the economic impacts and those consequences are going to be even greater. And I don't know whether, Vanessa... Yes, hi. They, hello. Um, yeah, I think that's my point, really, that there's been no proportion, proportionality about this. The government admitted that there was zero economic modelling that went on before they made this momentous decision, which is going to have, you know, affect us certainly for many years to come in terms of tanking the economy. Um, where we are at now is that deaths are below the five-year average. There's no evidence of a second wave. It's not really, the, the, the virus is not really existent in the community, it's in care homes and hospitals. And um, if you look at the epidemiological curve of deaths, we're right down at the tail end now. Um, and so surely we just need to open up the economy and get on with our lives. Surely it's time to stop fretting about you know the risk to under people under 65 is less for example than getting in your car and uh, of dying of covid and, and driving to work so surely it's time to stop um mucking about with with rules that people are largely ignoring in their personal life anyway and get the economy reopened of course we need to protect the people who this affects and this virus has shown that it uh, you know, we, we very clearly know who are the vulnerable people are there, people who are typically kind of over 70 and with underlying conditions or a very smaller number of the proportion, younger proportion. Surely young people should be out working, getting on with their lives, contributing to the economy and let's protect the people who need them and, and not be talking about not getting back to normal until we have vaccines. I think the, the these economic effects are going to cause terrible hardship and we've already heard Professor Sakura say that we're looking at 50 to 60,000 additional cancer deaths before their time and that's just cancer. Um, surely it's time we, we started to get this all in proportion and, um, and got the economy back open again. Thank you Vanessa. Mervyn? So I have a lot of sympathy with, with the way you put that but I think I would stress, perhaps I would as one of the over 70s, <laughs> that, that we, we don't know a great deal. And I think one of the mistakes that was made in all this was at the very outset to focus exclusively on the health aspects when talking about the lockdown. And instead of saying, you know, we are in a situation of tremendous uncertainty, none of us really know. And then so we've got somehow to find our way to balance, to use your word, proportionality, to understand that we're trying to achieve two quite different things. One is to keep the number of infections down and prevent the epidemic from spreading too far. And the other is doing great damage to the economy. And I think if the government at the very outset had basically said, look, you know, none of us really know. So the idea that there is one obvious policy to implement is, has never been true. But it's a weakness, I think, of politicians in an era where they're always under continuous media scrutiny, that everything they do has to be the right answer. And they can never admit mistakes. And if at the very outset they'd said, look, this is a very difficult and challenging problem. We don't know how serious this virus is. It is leading to deaths increasing. It's led to many deaths abroad. Therefore, we have to do something to contain it but we don't want to do so much that it will damage the economy irreparably and damage the health of non-COVID-19 patients, as you pointed out. And then over time to say, what well, we've learned a bit more in the past month, and now we can adjust the policy in the light of what we now know. That I think would have been a conversation 
where politicians could have said, you know, we have to lead, we have to take decision, but we're not going to pretend to you, we know the answer. And we will adopt and adapt our policy over time as we learn more, and we'll keep communicating with you, but we're not going to pretend that we are necessarily implementing something which will turn out later to be the perfect answer. We're, we're not. And I think as a result of not doing that and being very, very clear that we have to stay at home and the big switching policy that led to that lockdown, people did become frightened and are therefore themselves now rather unwilling, yeah. some of them, to go back to normal. So I think the government will find it not straightforward to uh, to reopen all parts of the economy and, and allow people to get back to normal. I think we will be seeing some of the consequences of this until we get a vaccine, which will enable everyone to say, I am no longer worried about catching the disease, either because I'm vaccinated against it or because I'm in an age group where I think that even if I get it, the consequences will be very, very small. But you're quite right in pointing to the problem that if you take influenza, which is not even a notifiable disease in the UK, it is in the United States. We have tens of thousands of people who die from that each year. Last year, 30,000 people were killed or seriously injured on the roads. Mm. We could have reduced that to nothing by implementing a 10 mile an hour speed limit, but no one would ever suggest of doing that. Mm. So the, it's always a question of trade-offs. And I think by not formulating the challenge to the country in terms of a trade-off, it's made it more difficult to come out of the lockdown. Mervyn, can I ask you, I want to bring in Mehdi Ascaria and Marcello Senna who've got their hands up, but I just wanted to pick up on something in your response there. I'm so interested by the number of times, even in the short conversation we've had, where you said, we don't know, or I don't know, or we just don't know. And I wondered whether you've changed in the way in which you're comfortable and confident in saying, we don't know the answer to that question. And in that context, I'd be really interested to know what you think about the running metaphor of the government's approach to this, which is, we're in a war, we're beating the disease, we're, the, the, the martial language that seems to have gone with the pandemic, which doesn't seem to fit with the language of, we don't know. So I understand why the government has been tempted to use that metaphor of this is a war, but it is highly misleading, I think. And, and like many metaphors, you can overdo it. And I think it has been overdone. I remember when I was at the bank giving evidence to a parliamentary committee once, and I was asked a question and I said, I don't know. And people were outraged on the committee. They said, what, what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, I don't know. And, and they said, but it's your job to know. And I said, but there are many questions to which not only I don't know the answer, but with great respect, nor do you. <laughs> and, and unless you can accept that there are things we don't know, you'll make big mistakes when confronted with major decisions. Because the problem with most decisions that we take, whether it's politicians or governments or businesses, or even ourselves in our ordinary everyday life, is that we know something but we never know enough. And coping with what John Kaye and I call in our book, radical uncertainty, is the essence of most real decisions. Mm. And it's not one that either economists or politicians coming from different directions seem to be very good at tackling. But the ability to recognize we don't know, and then either make a determined effort to find out something that we want to know more about, if we could find out, or recognizing that this is an area of uncertainty and coming to a judgment as to how we should cope with it. This is what real decision making is all about. Well, it's so interesting. I'm, I've kept my, my Medi and Marcello waiting. So I'm going to, Medi Ascario, um, are you there? You sound like you are. Hello, Medi. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, no pain. Uh, I heard your um, explanation with regard to the quantitative easing, and I, I pretend I understood it. But something which I'm struggling with is how come when you expand the money supply, the value of, of sterling have actually held? I recall the value of sterling being about $120, $125 um, uh, dollars per, per, uh, 
Terry Sterling. And I also recall when Robert Mugabe expanded his money supply, his currency fell like a lead balloon. <laughs> is, it, is the rule, is it geographically based that if they do it in some sectors, some, some, some regions in Africa, Robert Mugabe, he's got one effect. And if we do it here, powerful countries, it actually works uh, um, somewhat different. Well then, Mehdi, thank you. So it's a question of by how much you increase the money supply, and no more than that. The same effect would be true if we expanded the money supply in Britain at the same rate as Robert Mugabe had did in Zimbabwe, we would have exactly the same result, massive inflation. But most of our money supply comprises bank accounts. And in 2008, 2009, what was happening was that the banking system had lost confidence, it had made losses, and it was contracting its lending. Because it was contracting the amount it was lending to people, it was also contracting the size of the total bank deposits. So the money supply was falling in this country. That's a real risk because that could lead to a great depression. So since 95% of the money supply comprises the deposits issued by commercial banks, and only 5% the money supply created by the central bank, we basically had to double the amount of money that we were creating in order to prevent the overall money supply from falling. But we never got anywhere near expanding the money supply, even into double digits. Well, that's a far cry from doubling, tripling, expanding the money supply by thousands of a percent, which is what leads inextricably to hyperinflation. So you're quite right. It's not something one should take casually but the key question is, by how much is the money supply being expanded? And to in, be, give confidence that you're doing it in the right way, the right question to ask is, who's making the decision about it? Mm. Is it an independent central bank with a parliamentary mandate to maintain low inflation? Or is it a politician who wants to take all kinds of risks for the economy in order to finance the spending that they would like to undertake? Well, then, thank you. Can I, I'm, I'm going to bring in Louise Simpson, if I might, because I see there are a number of these questions, not about sort of classic money supply and <clears throat> like institutions of government, but about what's happening in businesses and amongst individuals. I mean, uh, Tom Jeffrey raises a question, as the recession bites and sex of the economy begin to demand bailouts, how do we avoid what ultimately happened after the 2008 crisis, where unsustainable private debt resulting from unsustainable business models were essentially made into public liabilities? And I think, Louise, are you there? Because I think yes. you're also asking this question about, am I right about private debt? Is that something you mind? Well, yes. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not a banker in any shape or form, but I, you know, as somebody who deeply suffered in the 2008 crash when credit was withdrawn, I kind of learned around that time that Europe, Europeans aren't allowed to build up the same level of, of private debt that we are. So in a sense, we have kind of compound debt even compared to other countries due to all this. And how on earth, if, if people haven't got any money, how are they gonna be able to sustain those debts? Mm. So really just, you know, what about private debt is really my question. How would you tackle that? <clears throat> so I think this is a major issue because we went into this crisis uh, with too much debt around the world, not in the UK explicitly, but in the, in the whole global environment. And I think it's a mistake to think that everything was fine before COVID-19 came along, it wasn't. The, the consequences of COVID-19 are that governments will come out of this with much higher levels of debt. I've explained, I think we can finance that. Businesses themselves will also come out with much higher levels of debt, and that's a concern. I think therefore the government ought in this situation to have done everything that it did, and possibly even more, to make guaranteed loans for small businesses, to help the self-employed, and to have schemes for large businesses. But there is no doubt that when we come out of this, some businesses will not come through it because they will need to contract, possibly the airlines, uh, for some years, the hospitality sector. Others will expand. Uh, the, the, the companies producing the technology through which we're able to communicate tonight. And those businesses that inherited a large amount of debt, came into this with a lot of debt, may eventually uh, fail. And I think the big challenge for economic policy after COVID-19, and we feel we've coped with it, 
will be to deal with a significant number of defaults. And that will be true across the world. So some governments, I think, will default. We're seeing it with some developing countries. But even some large emerging market economies are in serious problem. Argentina's renegotiating its debt. Italy's going to find it very difficult without help from the rest of the euro area to cope with its debt burden. Businesses around the world, the banking sector in Europe. The one saving grace is that the sector that has had the best crisis in terms of building up debt is the household sector, because most people have been saving money. Uh, and apart from those people who have literally lost their jobs or their businesses, the rest of the personal sector has actually been accumulating financial assets and running down debt. So, I, but I think the, the problems in the business sector, uh, even in the United States, uh, and the government sector in some countries will prove to be a major challenge for managing the world economy as we come out of this episode. And Mervyn, if you, if you were if you were trying to think through that particular problem um, now, one of the issues is that a lot of countries are issuing, and the UK is issuing what in this country they call bounce back loans. These 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 loans which are going to have to get repaid in twelve months' time. But <clears throat> are we ignoring a problem that's going to come and a bite us in the summer of 2021 when suddenly people are going to realize there's a huge amount of debt across small and medium sized businesses that are going to have to be repaid. And so, if you like, there's another wave that will hit the economy then. I think, though, it's worth the price to protect the businesses that were in existence when COVID 19 came along. Okay. This is one example where none of the businesses can be held responsible for the problems resulting from COVID-19. They didn't generate the virus and they didn't determine the government's decision to lock down the economy. And I think as taxpayers, we have to support those businesses to make sure they just don't disappear. And uh, there will be many loans don't get repaid, but that I think is part of the cost of trying to ensure that we don't lose the productive capacity of our economy which will be vital once we start to grow again. Uh, some of those loans won't fall due next year. They'll be continued. And when we get to next year, I'm sure the commercial banks will have a greater opportunity to assess whether or not they want to convert some of those loans into conventional bank loans. But at present, the vital thing that was needed was for government to step in with government guaranteed loans and grants to replace the revenue which businesses lost as a result of the government lockdown. Um, uh, thank you. I see in the chat people pointing out that the uh, bounce back loans have a six year term. Yeah, my point was that you begin to start repaying after your first year. So suddenly they, they become all, all the more real as you move into the repayment uh, phase and the interest payment phase. But, but, but Mervyn, can I just um, uh, ask you a little bit about the, the impact on employment because Jules Bagnoli, and I, I, forgive me, Jules, I hope I've got your name pronounced right, has raised this question about whether or not companies are choosing to make decisions on redundancies that go beyond what the pandemic requires, i.e. I... problems that have been hoarded up for, for a while. Jules, are you there? And, and you may be much more sort of, you may be Jules, in fact. Ah, no, you're Jules. Hello. <laughs> yeah, but I just say how charming it is that uh, Lord King has got a, a photo of a bank, uh, an image of the bank um, behind his head. It, 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 it's sincerity. We'll just double check we know who he is that way. That's it. <laughs> it helps me to know who I am, too. <laughs> or rather, who I was. Jules. And, uh, yeah. Yes. Oh. Go on. No, no, because no, no, you asked this question about, about companies and whether or not they're making decisions about the losing employees. Put, put the point you were making to, to Mervyn, because you may not have read it in the chat. I get a sense that there's a clear out happening, that it's a chance to, you know, brush out the dead wood and to reduce operating costs going forward. Um, Business models that are a bit shaky and maybe just taking this opportunity to slip out the market. People who are maybe a little bit um, not enjoying very, very competitive situations and maybe just taking the loan as a bung mm -hmm. and exiting and being able to walk away from debts with, uh, without losing face. 
with, with uh, loans and um, leases without losing face. So I, I think there's going to be, a, 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 there is a massive amount of turbulence occurring. And also I noticed that businesses are cutting their, their services, the, the service level to their clients. And I don't know if that'll come back. So for example, a call center might be working nine till five. And uh, I don't know if after the COVID they'll start restaffing at the weekend. So they're gonna have a permanently reduced sort of um, staffing levels. Um, yeah, I just wonder if it's just been used as, as, a, as an opportunity to regain margins. Mervyn? I don't think that businesses have any incentive to cut the labour force or the services they provide just for the sake of it. I think that the conditions of the furlough scheme are fairly clear. I know some businesses that are only too enthusiastic about trying to get back to work. They furlough their staff, they'd love to bring them back, and they have clients who will pay them money and they want to get back to business again. But there must be other businesses, I mean the airlines are the classic example I think, where they can see that governments don't want to keep this furlough scheme going for too long. They can clearly see themselves that their own business is not going to get back to normal for several years. They can't be sure, but there's a big risk of that. And so they have to plan for it. And it doesn't make sense, therefore, for them to pretend that everyone who comes back from the furlough scheme will be able to be retained. Um, now, that, of course, raises questions about the nature of the furlough scheme, because if that's simply the result of ending the lockdown, then the government should keep the furlough scheme going for long enough, with tough enough conditions, mm. to make sure that those jobs are not lost. But that some industries will decline relative to others, and that, that will inevitably mean, I think, some reallocation of jobs. People will be fewer people working for airlines and more people working for other businesses. Mm. But it is the government's job to worry about that transition and to make sure that it doesn't take place in the form of losing jobs first and then three years down the road some new jobs are created. That's why I think the furlough scheme needs to be continued right up until the point when we see GDP getting back very close to where it was before COVID-19, at which point we'll know that it isn't the overall level of activity in the economy that's generating the job losses, it's the business prospects of some companies and some industries. And there ought to be corresponding businesses and industries which will want to take on new employees because they're expanding. Mervyn, fa thank you. Uh, just out of interest, when you put that point, do, does the current Chancellor of the Exchequer, does Rishi Sunak call you up and ask you whether or not you take that view? Or do they, I think he's, no, he doesn't call me up and I think he's far too busy to do so. No, no, but, but it's, it's, I have conversations with you, James, and your, your <laughs> friends here. No, but it's, an interesting, it's, it's interesting to me the extent to which this government has pulled in the advice of people with experience from different walks of life, from with, of different political persuasions. I'm just interested to know whether or not they call on you and, uh, and, and people who served in government previously in, in, in trying to address this crisis. Well, I haven't been called. Um, I don't know about others, but I think the, the, the situation where it was really needed, and I think this was the lesson of the Second World War, mm. when Churchill brought in Beaverbrook to boost aircraft production, is that one of the things which the, the civil service or any public department, which operates very effectively in normal times, but it's not geared up and it's often not led by the kind of people you would choose, to deal with an emergency where something has to be done by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. That is not the spirit through which the civil service normally operates. And I think that the, the real things that have gone wrong here have often been logistical. That is, why could we not start producing protective equipment for health staff and others using our own companies in the economy faster than we did? Why was it that we couldn't get the testing up running properly? Why the app was now being abandoned and would be going back to Apple and Google for the app for dealing with testing and tracing? Why was it that we couldn't get the loans out to small businesses quickly enough? 
None of these were to do with decisions at the high policy level. They were all taken, but they couldn't be implemented. And one of the difficulties that politicians have, I think now, is that very few of them have had any experience of running anything. What they're used to doing is dealing with making, uh, I, I saw this myself during the financial crisis, what politicians tend to be, feel their job is, is to make public statements, to put out press releases, to speak to the media. But none of that gets translated easily into actions on the ground. And the failings in this crisis have been really to do with our inability to get things to work quickly and effectively on the ground. Some things did work well. I think it was very impressive how we got the Nightingale Hospital up and running, but the army had a good deal to do with that. People had to be brought in to, mm. to, to get results. And I think that is a lesson that governments need to remember for the future. So, so um, Mervyn, let me bring in Marcello, because I poor, poor, poor man, I've, uh, he's had his little blue digital hand up for a while now. Marcello, you wanted to raise a point. Yeah, I wanted just to link uh, uncertainty, the comments about uncertainty with monetary policy. And back in 2015, uh, 2005, you popularized the Maradona theory of the interest rates. You draw a parallel with football and you said at the time that markets at, uh, at times uh, react, uh, central, uh, react to what central banks are expected to do rather than what they actually do. Uh, 15 years and two financial crises later, what do you think about forward guidance? Do you think that we should do, central banks should do more forward guidance to reduce uncertainty? Or would you like to go back to the old days as you refer back then about the mystery and mystique of central bank this monetary decisions? Thank you, Marcelo. I, I, I'd steer it middle course. I wouldn't want to do either. I don't think the mystery and mystique of central banks was very productive. I think what matters is that people believe that the central bank is comprised of people who understand what it's possible to understand, but who are willing to admit that there are things we don't know. And so I think the great drawback with forward guidance is that if you start saying, well, you know, we'll maintain low interest rates for so many months, or we'll start raising interest rates three times over the next year, something unexpected happens and you can't do that. You then have to do the right thing, which is to change policy relative to what you said you thought you were going to do. And if you know that to begin with, it's better to say that, I think. So I'm not a great fan of trying to pretend that we know enough about the economy that you can give a guidance as to where interest rates will go in the future. And when that happened, both the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England found that their attempts to say, you know, when unemployment falls to a certain level, then we'll start to consider uh, raising interest rates. When unemployment did fall faster than they expected to that level, they then realized that the interpretation of that level of unemployment was different from the one that they expected to have. And they didn't want to start raising interest rates. So I don't think forward guidance helps. I think what really matters is to give a commentary on the economy tell a narrative story about what you and the central bank think is happening. Mm. And every three months, you then update it and say, well, we've learned something new in the last three months. This is how we've amended our narrative. And over time, you build up a sense that, well, at least these people in the central bank, they don't pretend to know what the future holds. None of us know. But they do understand more about how the economy works than anyone else. And so it's the right institution to be entrusted with the power to set interest rates. That's, I think, all you can do. I don't think it helps to have magic and mystery, to pretend that you know something that other people don't, and but you won't tell them. I think you should explain what you do know, but it's also very important to recognize that there are many things we don't know. We will learn about them as time passes, and then we'll react to that. That's the way to conduct, I think, a sensible monetary policy. Mervyn, we've just got a, a few, thank you for that, thank you for the question, Marcel, and th thank you, Mervyn, for the answer. But we've got a few minutes left, and I just wanted to ask, ask two questions. The, the first is, when you run through that list of the things that haven't worked, test and trace, small business loans, the, the, the list went on, and you look at the number of deaths in the UK, over 40,000 COVID-attributed uh, deaths, 
over 60,000 excess deaths and the UK leading the league tables in, the, in Europe for the, the worst forecasts on economic performance in the years to come. What do you think explains why it seems that the UK has been so particularly afflicted by this pandemic? I don't know. And I think the, the, ex, the, the post-mortem on this, the inquiry that will eventually come about, I hope won't start too soon because I think it's very important that the purpose of an inquiry is to learn lessons for the future because there will be future pandemics and we need to learn the lessons from this in order to help us cope better with a future pandemic. We don't know that enough about the nature of the virus. We really don't know enough about whether it's mutated when it moved from the Far East to Europe and then to North America. We don't know whether the apparently high rate of deaths in the UK really is a genuinely higher rate of deaths compared with what's happening abroad. We, don't, we can't really be confident of the reporting of death. We don't know whether it's the result of the failure to implement a large test and trace program at a certain point, or whether it's the result of greater comorbidity, whether you know, obesity uh, it was an issue. There are all kinds of things that we don't today know, and therefore I think it's not helpful really to speculate on them. What we will have to do is when their inquiry is held, there are really serious exercise in trying to get to the bottom of what actually happened and to get the best data we can, not just from the United Kingdom, but from other countries in order to make comparison. That I think is a big challenge over the next two to three years. It is, it's very interesting, Mervyn, as you were talking, there was just sort of a, a, a spate of comments about what, what, they, what people thought the answer was. I'm just gonna replay them to you because they're just really interesting partly about the complexity and the interlocking forces that have contributed to this in the UK. Linda Arch points out the, the reductions in the number of uh, civil servants. Mark Hutt just says simply decision making. Uh, I'm really interested in the point that Janet Arthur makes, which is, you know, we should have given more delegated authority, to local authorities and primary care systems that Germany have done this. Um, it, it's, it, it's just really interesting to me that the, 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 the extent to which this pandemic hasn't changed the country as much as revealed things about it and, and we're beginning to understand more more. I said I had two questions I've got one one final one it actually comes from my colleague Chris Cook I don't know Chris whether you want to put it whether you're uh, uh, there and on the line uh, it's about Mervyn it's about goal line technology sorry about goal line technology oh right <laughs> See, I think as a, as perhaps the country's most prominent Aston Villa fan, apart from our future king, <laughs> the and you've written a book about risk and uncertainty, and um, I think the the Hawkeye excuse as to why they, why Villa weren't, um, um, uh, well, why Villa got through yesterday is that, um, <laughs> that um, it was a one in nine thousand chance. For, for everyone, so, Mervyn, you better just explain. Right. Okay. So the Premier League, the Premier League restarted yesterday with the game at Villa Park, Aston Villa against Sheffield United. Aston Villa clearly dominated the game and played a better football, <laughs> but there was an extraordinary moment at the end of the first half when a free kick was caught by the Aston Villa goalkeeper, and his own player pushed him and took the ball over the goal line. A goal should have been awarded but wasn't because those decisions are now decided by technology and the referee didn't receive a signal saying that the ball had gone over the line. There have been many cases in the past where the ball has gone over the line and technology gave the right answer, but referees got it wrong. This was an occasion when the technology got it wrong. Now, I think we, th these, these things do happen, stuff happens. The, the, the explanation was, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to accept this as an explanation, the technology was tested before the match and was working. There are seven cameras covering that goal line, but there was a remarkable combination of positions of the ball, the goalkeeper, the, the Aston Villa player who pushed the goalkeeper into the net and the post itself that prevented any of those cameras from actually seeing where the ball was. Now, 
I don't think you can you can say that it was one in so many thousand. I don't think that means anything, frankly. All you can say is something happened that we hadn't expected to happen and hadn't planned for. It was a black swan. <laughs> no, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a black swan because we knew that we needed so many cameras in order to prevent that from happening. But in this occasion, even seven didn't turn out to be enough. In other words, we knew enough about this problem to use the technology, but we didn't know enough to realize that maybe there was a fallback camera, in this case, the one that was visible to viewers all over the country. And there was a system which should have taken precedence over the technology. We should have overridden it and said, look, we, we all saw this going over the goal line, therefore we must rule the goal. That didn't happen. But it's a, it's a very interesting example of what John Kay and I call in our book Radical Uncertainty. It's, it's not things that you, where you toss a coin and you know it's 50-50 or you're playing cards and you've got some odds that you can define, nor is it a pure black swan where you can't imagine it happening. It's something where you know something, like a pandemic could occur, but you don't know enough to know when or where it will occur. And that's what happened on that goal line yesterday. But I think the Aston Villa certainly deserved at least a draw from that game. Mervyn, thank you very much. Uh, Mark Hart has been commenting that are we now in extra time? I, I feel more like <laughs> like a man watching go The Godfather Two, which is you're watching, you're thinking, my God, this could be even better than The Godfather One. Maybe we should have had a whole thinking on Aston Villa and goal line technology rather than wasted quite so much time on the economy <laughs> and the fate of the world. But but listen, a, a big thank you to everyone who joined us this evening, uh, particularly to you. Uh, Mervyn, I know that I didn't manage to get to everyone's um, point or question you, you couldn't possibly have done, but, but I think more than anything, I won't try to recap what you said, except to say that it, it's actually liberating uh, to hear someone like you uh, say with such confidence that there is, a, there is an advantage in admitting uh, what you don't know and when you don't know it. Um, and uh, it's certainly something that I know in, in the profession that Chris and I are in, in the business that I are in journalism, we could do with a bit more of it too. So um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lord King, Mervyn King. We can't applaud you, um, but we can wave cheerfully. And what <laughs> else we can do is go out and buy your book, Radical exactly. Uncertainty. <laughs> and go and buy it, as Liz says, from an independent bookseller. We're trying to make sure those people stay in business. Uh, a big thank you to you. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mary. Good night, everyone.